Hello, my name is Dr. Gulshan Sharma. Uh, I'm a pulmonary critical care physician by training and I serve as the chief medical officer of the University of Texas Medical Branch. We at UTMB Health are very pleased to once again be with you for another inspirational evening of listening and learning from the Space Center Houston. It is our pleasure to help bring you the Thought Leader series. We have enjoyed being part of every session this past year. It's been a challenging year for all of us, one of change, adjustment, accommodation, and vigilance. In the health field and in my role at UTMB, we have worked hard to monitor and stay ahead of the ebbs and flows of COVID in our communities. We have worked to keep our employees and students safe as well as provide excellent care for our patients who were hospitalized during that time. We are now in the holiday season and we all are so starved for the love and companionship of our family and friends. It's the best time of the year, a time I cherish. But I'll be celebrating the holidays differently this year and I hope you also celebrate it responsibly and safely. There has been excellent progress on the development of several effective vaccines and therapeutics supported in part by innovative work at UTMB and researchers around the globe. Plans are underway to make these vaccines and treatments available in the coming months and we look forward to the day that we are able to resume these sessions in person at Space Center Houston. For now, we at UTMB wish you the best and the healthiest of holidays and invite you to sit back and enjoy some of the great speakers and this Thought Leader Series sessions. Thank you. Hello, I'm William T. Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston. We're a dynamic science and space exploration learning destination. We're a nonprofit science center and also serve as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human space exploration, past, present, and future. With more than 1.5 million visitors annually from around the world through on site and virtual experiences. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program, International Co Cooperation in Space, ISS 20, presented by University of Texas Medical Branch. Our series features space and science experts from across the country and around the world who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Before we begin our program, I'd like to share how Space Center Houston is offering a variety of opportunities for you to be part of space exploration. We invite you to join Space Center Houston this holiday season for Galaxy Lights presented by Reliant. It returns uh, November 14th through January 3rd as an immersive holiday lights tradition, bringing guests the most interactive and technologically advanced light display in Texas. Explore the center in a new way with stunning space themed light installations, two kinetic light shows, the suspended moving lights, and photo stations set among actual space artifacts. This year's Galaxy Light celebrates the 20th anniversary of continuous human habitation aboard the International Space Station with an all new lights around the world display surrounding the new permanent outdoor exhibit, a flown SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. For a list of activities and to purchase your advanced time tickets, please go to our website at spacecenter.org. As we navigate this unique period, Space Center Houston is committed to supporting our community with authentic science learning experiences in a safe environment. We've opened new exhibits, new live shows, and spacious outdoor experiences with additional health and safety measures at the forefront of our daily operations. You can save time in line with advanced time ticket admissions. You'll also experience one of our most popular tours, the NASA Tram Tour, which takes guests behind the scenes at NASA Johnson Space Center. Through the Space Center Houston free app, you can select and reserve seats on the tram tour you wish to board at a designated time, so no more waiting in long lines. Plan your journey with us today and go to spacecenter.org. You can also take a virtual tour of Space Center Houston through our app using augmented reality, where we also have videos and audio stories about the future and historic feats in human space exploration. You also can learn about activities students and families can do together and our Try This at Home blog series. Follow Space Center Houston's blog on spacecenter.org. To help bring this content to you, we ask that you consider becoming a member or making a donation to help bolster and expand our digital delivery of educational resources for the community. Now I'm excited to move on to our panel, International Cooperation in Space, ISS 20, presented by UTMB. As I mentioned, this year marks 20 years of continuous human habitation on the International Space Station. 
as part of our recognition of this incredible achievement made possible through international collaboration, we'll hear from a panel of astronauts and how they lived, worked, and collaborated aboard the International Space Station. I'm thrilled to introduce our moderator, Melanie Saunders, who will in turn introduce our panel. Melanie is NASA's Deputy Associate Administrator. In this capacity, she advances all aspects of the agency's functions, policy, and integration of programs. She chairs the NASA Mission Support Council, which serves as the agency's senior decision-making body regarding the integrated agency mission support portfolio. During her distinguished career at NASA, she served as acting deputy director of NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston and the associate director managing one of NASA's largest installations with nearly 11,000 civil service and contract employees. Melanie served as associate manager of the International Space Station program from 2005 to 9 during the most intensive phases of ISS assembly. She joined NASA in 1994, negotiating international agreements and managing export control for the ISS station program. Melanie has received many, many recognitions, including the Meritorious Presidential Rank Award, two NASA Outstanding Leadership Medals, NASA Exceptional Service Medal, a Silver Snoopy, and numerous other individual and group achievements. And I'm also pleased to say she is a former member of the Space Center Houston Board of Directors. So now I'd like to turn it over to Melanie Saunders. Thanks, William, for your very kind introduction. I very much appreciate it. I'm really honored to be here today to participate in this distinguished panel of, of astronauts. Um, it's really exciting for me to be celebrating 20 years of life aboard the ISS. And we have uh, astronauts here today who can talk about some of the beginnings of the ISS program, the early days, uh, life on board the ISS, and uh, communicating with the ISS from Mission Control and planning for future exploration missions. So I'm, uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this. Um, let me introduce our panelists. Um, first, uh, NASA astronaut Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Uh, Ellen is a, a California a native and a veteran of four space missions, which is in, on its own impressive. She served as the 11th director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. She was JSC's first Hispanic director and its second female director. Uh, Dr. Ochoa joined NASA in 1988 as a research engineer at Ames Research Center. She was selected as an astronaut in 1990 and became the first Hispanic woman to go to space when she served on the nine-day STS-56 mission in 1993. She also flew on STS-66, STS-96, and STS-110, logging nearly 1,000 hours in orbits. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in physics and a master's degree and a doctor degree in electrical engineering. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Next, we have European Space Agency um, astronaut, Captain Samantha Cristoforetti. Milan native Captain Cristoforetti joined the Italian Air Force in 2001. She attended the Euronato Joint Jet Pilot Training Program at Shepard Air Force Base in the US, where she earned her fighter pilot wings in 2006. She was selected as an ESA astronaut in 2009. In 2014, um, Captain Cristoforetti launched as a flight engineer for ISS Expedition 42-43. After 200 days in space, she returned to the Earth on June 11, 2015. She is now crew representative for ESA in the Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway Project. She is also part of a working group tasked with working with ESA's Chinese counterparts to define and implement cooperation in the field of astronaut operations. She has a bachelor's degree in aeronautical sciences and a master's degree in mechanical engineering. She has researched aerodynamics in Toulouse, France and solid rocket propellants in Moscow, Russia. Wow, pretty diverse set of experiences. Last but not least, we have Canadian Space Agency astronaut Colonel Jeremy Hansen. Um, Jeremy is an Ontario native. He joined the Canadian Armed Forces in 1994. He served as a CF-18 fighter pilot. He completed his CF-18 fighter pilot training in 410 Tactical Fighter Operation Training Squadron from 2003 to 2004. Hansen was one of two recruits selected by the Canadian Space Agency in 2009 through the third ast Canadian astronaut recruitment campaign. In 2011, he graduated from astronaut uh, candidate training. Hansen currently represents CSA at NASA and works at the Mission Control Center as a CAPCOM, the voice between the ground and the ISS. And we hope to hear more about that later in the panel. He holds a bachelor's degree in space science and a master's degree in physics. 
our panelists will now um, uh, tell you a little bit about themselves and some of their work, and then we'll ask them some questions after that. So first, I would like to call on uh, Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Thanks, Ellen. Well, thank you so much, Melanie, and it's great to see you and, uh, of course, Jeremy and uh, Samantha and, and also William, and I'm really happy to be part of the panel today. You know, I was really fortunate to spend quite a bit of my career at NASA in one way or another uh, supporting the International Space Station program. So this is quite a milestone this year. Um, in the mid 90s, uh, after I'd flown my first couple of shuttle missions, uh, I was assigned the job in the astronaut office to lead the astronaut office support of the International Space Station program. And this was uh, not too long after Russia had been added to the partnership. So, uh, you know, in the US, we were still designing and developing uh, what the US segment would look like and, and how it would interface with the Russian segment. And I had the opportunity to, um, over a couple of years or so, uh, negotiate with members of the Russian Space Agency on crew specific items like um, how we were we going to select multinational crews? Uh, how were we going to train them? Where were we going to train them? What language? And really then the concept of, of operations on board, how were the crews going to work together? So kind of got to be right in on the beginning of that. And then uh, a few years later, I was lucky enough to be on the uh, one of the very earliest shuttle missions that were part of the assembly sequence. In fact, this it was the second shuttle mission part of the assembly and was the very first one to dock with the station. This is what the station looked like at the time that we were headed up there. And you can see it's just two modules. Um, on the top is the is the US node and then the, the Russian FGB. It was about 40 feet long. There wasn't any habitation module yet on board, so nobody was living on board. Um, so uh, really our job was to go up and um, help prepare it for the first crew to uh, transfer a whole bunch of supplies, uh, both inside and out. So uh, this is me with uh, Julie Payette from the Canadian Space Agency. And, and this is uh, what we spend a lot of our time doing. Um, this is actually in the middle of the FGB and you can see the storage bags. And uh, we had to just transfer a whole lot of stuff that we brought up on the shuttle. A lot of it went behind panels. Um, in the FGB and in the node. And, uh, you know, we were uh, trying to put it exactly where it needed to go so it would be ready for the next cruise. As I mentioned, this was right at the beginning of the assembly of the International Space Station. So we brought up these uh, construction signs. Uh, we had a crew of seven, and so it was five uh, NASA astronauts and a Canadian astronaut and a Russian cosmonaut. So you can see we were. Um, already uh, essentially an international crew, even though uh, we weren't yet living on board. One of the other things that for me was a highlight on this mission is um, of my four shuttle missions, this is the only one uh, where there were actually other women on the flight. And um, in the nine months or so before this mission, I had been on a presidential commission uh, to celebrate uh, Amer women in American history. And it was timed for, as the 150th anniversary of the first women's rights convention in the United States in Seneca Falls. And um, so through being on that commission, I was able to borrow this flag that you see here in this slide. And this, of course, is the flag that was used by the National Women's Party 100 years ago as they were fighting for women's suffrage. And uh, so I was able to take up this historical document and uh, me and uh, Canadian astronaut Julie Payette and NASA astronaut Tammy Jernigan um, unfurled it in the middle of the uh, US node on the International Space Station and just kind of drew that line between um, everybody who helped fight for the right for women to vote through uh, changing laws in our country that actually allowed us to become astronauts at that point in time. Uh, one of the things our crew liked to do uh, all the time during training was play cards, mainly hearts. Um, I can remember when we went over to train in Russia for a little bit, we spent the, the whole plane flight there and back um, playing cards. Uh, we had the opportunity to spend about a week training 
Um, in Star City, Russia, the Gagarin uh, Cosmonaut Training Center, since we were going to be doing activities in the Russian FGB. We went there along with the STS-88 crew, which of course was the very first assembly crew that brought up the node. And then we all went to Baikonur to actually see the FGB. This was about a month, month before it launched into space. So uh, later on, when we actually launched and went into space, so we we had to bring our cards with us and, and try to play, although I'll have to admit it's very hard in, uh, in zero G. So uh, after this flight, um, then I was back on the ground and my job was to lead the Capcom branch of the astronaut office. And of course, Capcoms are the ones who uh, actually work in mission control and talk to crews when they're on orbit. And uh, so as we were sending up other assembly crews. Uh, we had a group of astronauts who were speaking to them during their missions. Uh, but during the time I was leading that branch, we really had to prepare for and transition to a period where we were now going to be um, having people in the station mission control room 24-7, uh, which is something that, of course, we didn't have experience with having um, just flown shuttles for a few decades. Um, and it's actually when we transitioned to the first um, Capcoms who actually weren't astronauts because we, we really just didn't have enough people to be able to staff um, continuously 24 seven with, with the astronauts in that position. And uh, a few years later, I got uh, the opportunity to go back to the International Space Station on STS-110. So this was in 2002. And we were um, kind of starting what was known as the third phase of assembly. And so by this time, of course, there was a habitation on module on board. People um, had been living on board for a couple of years uh, at that time. Uh, we had just gotten the robotic arm up in the airlock. And uh, so our job was to bring up the very first piece of the truss structure. So over many flights after ours that was built out to be about 350 feet long and of course three more solar arrays came up and that allowed um, the station to power for the european lab and the japanese lab so uh, this photo that you see here is what the station looked like at this point in the assembly uh, as sts 110 was coming up actually it's it's at sort of at the end of our mission because there's a, a dark rectangle sort of in the center there. And that's that's the piece that we brought up. It was known as S0. So one of my jobs on this mission was to operate the new station uh, robot arm. It had been used um, to uh, move some pieces of equipment around, but we were actually the first crew to use it to move spacewalking crew members around. Um, and so this is just me at the robotics workstation um, helping to install the truss and then um, moving crew members around. And as you can see, there's there's no windows. Um, this was uh, long before the cupola came up. And so you couldn't look out and actually see the arm moving. And so it was uh, one of the things we tried to do was get a um, couple of good uh, camera views to be able to see it. And then we had some simulations that also let us know how it was moving. And here's a view uh, that someone else was able to get, um, I think, out of uh, the shuttle window of what s looked like on the end of the robot arm as we were moving it, you know, after we lifted it up out of the shuttle payload bay and we're getting ready to move it uh, into position onto the zenith side of the space station. So uh, there were seven of us on this crew. And then of course there was a, a station crew that we met when we came up there, a crew of three. So altogether uh, 10 folks. And that was the uh, Expedition 4 crew that was already on board. They've been on board about uh, four months by the time that we got up there. So we all worked together um, to do the tasks that we had. And uh, our, our flight slipped a little bit, but at the time we were packing for it, we thought we were gonna be up during a Houston rodeo time. So all of you watching um, in Houston know how big a deal that is. So we brought up our bandanas and we brought up some uh, barbecue uh, beef and, and corn um, to be able to share with the station crew during that time. 
And here's just a view of me um, actually in the Russian segment of the International Space Station during that flight. There's a, a couple of traditions that all the assembly uh, missions had when they were on board. They'd add their crew patch um, to this panel uh, inside the International Space Station. So here's our commander, Mike Bloomfield, adding our patch. And on the next slide, uh, you can see that he's uh, writing in the ship's log. So the very first mission, STS-88, uh, brought up a ship's log and uh, every crew um, had the opportunity then to, to write a message and, and actually leave a photo. So I know on uh, my earlier mission, STS-96, we left that photo of us playing cards uh, in the ship's log. So after this mission, I had the chance to um, take on a variety of management and leadership roles at Johnson Space Center. Um, one of these was as the director of flight crew operations, which is the organization that manages both the astronaut office and uh, the aircraft ops division. And as part of that role uh, for a period of about a year or so, uh, I headed what is known as the multilateral crew operations panel. So it's really the heads of all of the crew offices for the five space agencies that make up this partnership. And so uh, our main job at that time was to uh, make sure that we were preparing crew members to fly on the International Space Station and then actually determining um, what space agencies would have um, crew opportunities and when they were, and then to actually uh, select the crews for that. And then later on, of course, I became uh, first deputy center director and then center director at Johnson Space Center. Um, during the time of both of those, we finished assembly. We saw the first crew that included members of all five of the international partners. And as I was center director, uh, because assembly was done, what we really tried to focus on was increasing productivity and really getting to use um, ISS as a laboratory in much the same way that you might use a laboratory on Earth. But of course, um, doing experiments and testing out technology that you could not do on Earth. So I was definitely excited just a few days ago to see uh, the crew one uh, crew show up, the, the joint NASA SpaceX mission that brought them there, um, knowing how much more science is now going to be able to get done uh, when we've got four more people on board, so a total of seven. So thanks so much, Melanie. Thank you, Ellen. It's very, very interesting, and I'll be asking you a few questions in a little bit about your experiences. Uh, next, I'd like to call on uh, Captain Samantha Cristoforetti to tell us a little bit about her background and experience. Samantha? Yes, hello, and uh, it's really wonderful to be uh, speaking today with this uh, amazing group of people. And uh, it's been fascinating listening to Ellen's talk because I have the feeling that joining the European Astronaut Corps in 2009 and then flying, you know, starting training in 2011, 2012, and then flying in 2014, I basically reaped the benefit of, you know, her work. Uh, both as an astronaut and then later as a, as a leader at uh, at NASA and basically jumped into this International Space Station program that was by that time fully, you know, up and running, operational, running very, very smoothly. So uh, thank you very much to to Ellen and and uh, and all the people who have done all that hard uh, preparatory work in, in much more uncertain times than the ones I, I lived through. Um, yeah, so uh, I think the focus today is um, is international cooperation. So this this you know very strong international aspect of of course the International Space Station program, and it's amazing that we're celebrating the 20th years already of continuous habitation. And so I guess I will uh, start out by by saying what um, our um, leadership at, at ESA always likes to underline, but that, that is, I think, also, you know, there is very much a lot of truth to it, which is when it comes to international cooperation, we at ESA have a little bit of a head start in a way because we are ourselves an agency which is made up of uh, many member states uh, working together. So this is, of course, a, a, an ESA patch, especially an older version, now there's a, a new one. 
um, you know, with, with the flags of, uh, I believe it's 22 member states. And then if you look at the bottom of the slide and at the far right, the last three flags, those are uh, cooperating uh, countries that are not actually member states. You, know, you certainly recognize um, Canada at the, the far right, which is not a, a European country, but it's a cooperating country. So that international aspect is very much embedded uh, within our agency from, from the start. And then, of course, um, when it comes to the International Space Station, it's, of course, a product of this uh, incredible international effort. And in a way, I think we, we, we astronauts often like to say, and I certainly believe that, one of the big legacies of this program is really to have shown how it is possible to build such a complex, amazing infrastructure in orbit through an international cooperation, but probably even harder than that to um, operate it in a robust, uh, continuous way for now over two decades, um, you know, while working through the, the you know, the, the benefits, but also the difficulties sometimes of, you know, getting all the partners uh, to agree on, on a course of action and, you know, probably you know, when Ellen started out working on this, it was probably maybe at points frustrating and maybe, you know, there were even some doubts on whether it was going to work out. And now we can say it did. You know, the International Space Station has proven that that is possible. Um, and I think that's that's an incredible legacy that we'll, uh, we will benefit from in, in future programs as well. Of course, I'd, I'd like to show the European piece of hardware on, on board, the, the main one, uh, which is the, the Columbus uh, Laboratory, um, in which we, 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 of course, run research for all the international partners, as well as, of course, with the um, European research community. So my generation of, of European astronauts, we were selected in 2009, shortly after the Columbus was launched, because that's when we started having regular um, long duration um, space flights on, on board. So when I started my training, I just put down here a little bit, I'm not gonna comment this in detail, but it's just a collage of, of pictures uh, taken all over the world. And I will get a little bit in detail in the next slides of my training, which for that first flight was about uh, three years long. So we started out in, uh, in Europe, uh, this is a picture of the European Astronaut Center, and of course we have mock-ups specifically of the European contributions and specifically the, the Columbus module. Um, afar in the right, you can also see the, the ATV, which is not flying anymore, but it was a, a cargo resupply vehicle that was provided by ESA. And then we started out at EAC with uh, with some basic training. For example, um, just a couple of uh, pictures here, we did some introduction you know like a familiarization training with uh, um, EVA like spacewalking uh, procedures and tether protocols and safety protocols we don't have an actual suit but we were able in a simplified way to get a little bit of a head start in in that in in Europe and um, same thing with um, uh, robotics we got our um, very basic generic robotic training in uh, at ESA at, at EAC as part of our basic training um, and then when I was assigned, I, I really started living with my suitcases in, in hand, moving from training center to training center. You know, one of the most important ones, of course, is the Johnson Space Center. This is a picture of Building 9, where we, where NASA has uh, uh, mock-ups of, um, of the entire space station, basically. And we, you know, practice all, uh, all kinds of, uh, of situations in there, ranging from emergencies to routine operations. This is a picture from a routine operations uh, sim. And also, you know, those really, really glamorous aspects of uh, space flight as, you know, changing <laughs> changing the, the solid waste container of the toilet when that is full. And, you know, eventually it's going to be your turn to do that. And so you, you need to know how to do that. And we train for that. And then, of course, we train in this um, amazing facility, which is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, this gigantic pool that, you know, no kidding, uh, contains a real size replica of all the of all the space station, basically excluding the the uh, the Russian modules. And I, I really enjoyed 
um, the the hard. I mean, it, it's really hard training, especially for people like me who are a little bit of a smaller size. Um, but I really enjoyed uh, training in in the suit there for spacewalks. I did not have a chance of of doing a spacewalk, regrettably, in on my first space flight. But I, I did um, have a chance to um, to fly the robotic arm. So I think Ellen mentioned earlier that uh, she didn't have a chance to look outside uh, because the cupola wasn't there yet. I did have that chance. So this is the uh, primary robotic workstation is now in the cupola and I had a chance to fly in the, the robotic arm from there to, to grapple a um, a Dragon cargo vehicle that uh, arrived on, on space station, which brings me, of course, to the next uh, international partner. Um, as you can see there, it's written quite big on the on the arm. It, it's often also called the Canada Arm 2. Uh, and so I, as part of my, you know, going around the world to trade, I also had a chance to spend a couple of uh, um, really cool weeks in, uh, in Montreal in, in Canada, uh, learning the basics of, of flying the, the Canada Arm. Um, and then, you know, fast forwarding for a moment on, on Space Station, um, this is in the Japanese module, the JAMS, so another partner of the International Space Station. And um, again, I had some uh, some opportunities to, to, to spend uh, a week or two uh, over my training flow in, in Japan, learning among other things to operate the Japanese airlock that you can see here. Um, and you can see it on the next picture as it's open to the outside, right? You can use it to, to move things in and out of uh, the space station. Um, and then you can use the uh, Japanese robotic arm, uh, among other things, to uh, deploy small uh, satellites like the tiny little CubeSat that you can see in that picture. So all of that I, I trained for in, uh, in Japan. And then, of course, I did spend um, as, as a flight engineer on, on the Soyuz, which is the Russian vehicle that uh, took me to the International Space Station. I, I had to become very, very familiar with the systems and the operations and, and some aspects of manual flying of the Soyuz vehicle. And so I spent uh, uh, quite some time over the years in, in this uh, um, amazing place, which is Star City. You, you can see that on that uh, that's tone, you know, what, what's written there is Vyosny, uh, which is the Russian for uh, star in, in Star City. So this uh, this little town tucked away in, in the woods outside of, uh, of Moscow, where um, I trained for, um, as I said, for serving as a flight engineer on, uh, on the Soyuz. On the next slide, um, you can see a couple of, of pictures of that. That's um, myself with my commander. Uh, inside the Soyuz simulator, and that's our entire crew uh, basically picking our envelope with the um, exam scenario. So that uh, you know that envelope will contain a number of anomalies and failures that we will have to deal with throughout the day as we simulate launch, docking, um, and then undocking and re-entry through the atmosphere and landing on the Soyuz. And uh, if we pass that exam, then we will. Uh, officially have finished their training or at least in that concept of you know flying on on the Soyuz um, and we will be able to uh, move to Baikonur to uh, Kazakhstan and launch on a Soyuz rocket to the uh, to the International Space Station and um, and of course we were again in very much an international crew um, it was myself from Italy and in the center our commander Anton Shkaplerov and on, uh, on your left, uh, uh, NASA astronaut Terry Birds. And it's really um, funny because we were all a crew completely uh, made of former combat pilots, which, you know, there's a lot of combat pilots in, in the astronaut corps, but it's not that common to have a crew that's made only of former combat astronauts. Um, so it was, uh, it was really cool. We, we even made a patch that basically had the Soyuz. I, as the Soyuz projecting a shade on the Earth, and the shade is in the form of an airplane, which is made of pieces of our um, respective planes. So we, we thought that was uh, that was pretty cool. And then when we arrived on, on space station, um, there were three people already on board. Of course, two uh, two Russian colleagues, uh, Sasha and Yelena, um, and uh, Butch Wilmore, who uh, was going to be our commander in the first half of our expedition. Um, and we became um, altogether expedition 42 
uh, which I thought was really cool because, as you know, 32 is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. So you can't get a better expedition than, than that. Moving to the future, um, as I said, I, I think, you know, one of the big legacies of Space Station is certainly this uh, frame of international cooperation. And, you know, certainly there's lessons learned, there's things that can be done better and in a more efficient way in the future, but uh, it's all based being confident that, that it does work out and it can work out uh, fine. And that's um, and so that's a great starting point for the future as well. And this is a, an artist concept of uh, Gateway, which is the next uh, big infrastructure that will be built in, in space, but a lot further out. You know, Space Station is in low Earth orbit, it's about 400 kilometers away. Uh, Gateway will be orbiting around the moon, so, you know, 400,000 kilometers away almost. Uh, so a big, uh, big step in uh, in the conquest of space and definitely a big uh, step on the way to, uh, you know, to, to, to even further, you know, one, one day going, uh, going to Mars. ESA is going to provide uh, uh, a number of infrastructure elements for Gateway. Uh, including the this is called international habitat, so one of the main habitation modules, um, and also a communication infrastructure and a uh, refueling element, which I I, I really hope uh, this will remain in the specifications. As an astronaut, we really like windows, and so that refueling module, uh, and, and the way things stand now, is also going to have uh, amazing uh, pictures, uh, amazing windows uh, on 360 degrees. So that, that should give us amazing views of, uh, of the moon and uh, possibly the Earth. This last slide is, uh, is Orion, which is, of course, the, the vehicle that will uh, bring astronauts uh, to this lunar space uh, and, uh, and to Gateway. Um, and again, very much a product of international cooperation. Uh, it's, a, it's a NASA vehicle um, as far as the pressurized part is concerned, but this uh, back part, which is uh, you can see very nicely in this picture, the service module with the propulsion, the, the main propulsion, the solar panels, the thermal control, um, consumable uh, storage, uh, and a number of other functions that is provided by, by ESA. So it's, uh, it's just called European service modules. So um, a lot of international cooperation on the way forward to the moon as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samantha. I'll look forward to asking a few more questions in a few minutes about you know, some of your experiences and the plans for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll turn to uh, Colonel Jeremy Hansen, Canadian Space Agency, who's going to uh, tell us a little bit about his experience. Jeremy? Thanks, Melanie. You know, I thought I'd, I'd start uh, echoing a little bit what Samantha said. I really liked how you put that, how you know, we're taking advantage of, of Alan's work and, and really all those that have come before. And, you know, if we go back to the beginning, um, you know, really it was the, in the Americans that led us um, to the moon, initially, and for me, that really came down to inspiration. It was so inspirational. In fact, um, it definitely mo uh, put in motion a nation to accomplish a huge goal, but also um, it, it attracted a bunch of Canadians, for example, and I'm sure others from around the world to contribute uh, to those efforts in, in different and small ways. Um, but for me, even though those landings happened before I was born, growing up as a young Canadian, I, I saw images like this and I mean, I have a distinct recollection of this burned in my brain. Um, and, and I thought, wow, that opened up what was possible for me. It really inspired me to set some big goals. And in fact, I, I didn't know any better. I just thought, well, you know, I, I guess I can explore space and become a space explorer. And the inspiration that space has provided me through my life has been a guiding star. And even though I haven't thrown flown in space yet uh, today, it's still a goal that I have sitting out there for me that informs my decisions, it motivates me, but most importantly, um, it's something I share with others and allows me to collaborate. And it's really a whole bunch of other people that, that make these things possible, um, not the individuals by themselves. And as Melanie mentioned in my introduction, I joined our Canadian Astronaut Corps in 2009, and, uh, and then this is our current active Corps today. So, Canada is a relatively small partner, 
in, in this program, but uh, these are our four astronauts. So you've got uh, Jenny Saidi Gibbons there and Josh Kutrick and David St. Jacques, who actually just came back from space not too long ago on behalf of Canada. I thought today I'd give you a, a couple anecdotes of experiences I've had on my journey to prepare for space, but more importantly, to contribute to the international collaboration that makes the, the International Space Station possible today and sets us up for our future goals. Uh, and one of these uh, was this uh, murky uh, view here you have of the Aquarius habitat. And this is something you may have heard of, it's called Nemo missions, but we, we, we call these analog missions in that they, they represent um, for astronauts training what it's going to be like to uh, serve inside the International Space Station, for example, or to be part of a crew on Mars. So in this image, you'll see that in that habitat that's, that's sitting on the ocean floor, we were actually a crew of six. So we had uh, two personnel who were experts in running and maintaining the habitat. And then we had uh, two participants from ESA, one from NASA, and then myself from Canada. And, and we lived in this tin can on the ocean floor for a week. And for us, it was a tremendous opportunity to Know, get a feeling for what it was going to be like to be in a cramped environment, to have to work as a team, to live with some of the stressors of, you know, real managing real risks. I and mean, when you're when you're living on the ocean floor, you know, anything about diving, you're you're saturated with nitrogen. So there is a lot of risk you're managing with just uh, protecting your own lives. But in addition to that, we were actually leveraging this opportunity to do some research. And we simulated uh, a mission to Mars where we were dealing with a time delay. And our time delay was five minutes. And depending on where Mars and Earth are in their orbits, your, your time delay might be five minutes, it might be 20 minutes. Um, but we just used five. And we were trying to figure out how, how do we become efficient at doing operations when you can't just call uh, mission control and get an instantaneous answer from them. So that was a really neat experience. In this photo, um, you're actually seeing how we get in and out of the habitat. So, um, and it was the same as the previous photo, we're in in the, the entryway, which is sort of like doing the upside down glass experiment where um, if you, you, know, you fill a glass of water in a sink and then you, you lift it up out of the water upside down, but it doesn't break the seal, that water will stay in the glass. And this is kind of what's going on in this habitat, so in reverse. Um, the air is trapped in the habitat, and we just have a hole in the bottom of the habitat that we can swim in and out of um, without having to go through an actual airlock. Uh, pretty neat experience. But uh, one of the most important reasons we use these analogs in astronaut training is actually to work on our team skills. Uh, these team skills, of course, uh, are important for the astronauts who are in the tin can in space, but they're also important for all of us in the international collaboration. Something that we're always working on is how do we work better together? How do we work on our communication skills? And so astronauts are very intentional about this, this training today. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time talking about it even before we go into a training event like NEMO. While we're in the training event, debriefing around the dinner table, for example, and just trying to bring out you know, how we can better uh, function as a team. And then of course, after the event. So NEMO, as it turns out, was a great space mission training um, opportunity for me and all of us, but uh, it was also just an incredible life experience. Living on the ocean floor, seeing the marine life from a different perspective, realizing that the marine life has habits, like daily habits, they go to the same place, do the same things every day. I just found that absolutely fascinating. It was a really rich life experience. Uh, the next anecdote I wanted to share with you is uh, working in mission control. So in this shot, you have uh, Emily, uh, our flight director. You've got Ricky, a fellow astronaut. He's the actual Capcom on this day in mission control, and then myself. And I'm what we call the ground IV. And this is the person who um, talks to the astronauts who are outside the space station actually doing the spacewalk. So I'm basically walking them through the directions to execute the spacewalk. Ricky's job is to um, take care of all the communications for the astronauts who are still inside the ISS during the spacewalk. And then Emily, she's the big boss. She's in charge of the, of the uh, flight control room. She's the flight director. So on the spacewalk, what we were actually doing was a series of five spacewalks to repair the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is a really neat experiment that's on, on the outside of the International Space Station. And it's searching primarily for dark matter. It's a particle physics experiment. It's really, really fascinating stuff. 
Um, and it, it's been on space station doing great research for many years, but unfortunately the cooling system, which is critically important, was failing on the alpha magnetic spectrometer and we needed to swap it out. So in order to repair this cooling system, we had to do some things that had never been done on a spacewalk before. And probably the most sensitive and challenging of that was to get in, basically, to, it's like tearing into the, under the hood of your car. Um, we had panels that were never meant to be opened in space. Uh, they had never foreseen this type of failure. And then dig all the way down into this one panel you see on the left, which is these tiny tubes. And we had to cut these tubes and then on the right, you see we have a whole bunch of cut tubes that we've capped so that we don't puncture uh, the spacesuits of the uh, astronauts Drew and Luca who were, who were doing the spacewalks. Um, and then we had to tie in a new cooling system. So we, we or, or I should, well, we, the huge team, you can imagine it was just an enormous team of really talented people who came up with the methodologies that we would use to basically splice in a new cooling system. And what you see on the right side of the screen is the special adapter that had been designed uh, to make these connections. And uh, years of work went into trying to figure out how we could successfully do this with a lot of failures along the way, if you will, ideas that just didn't work until we landed on one that we thought would. And the, the story that I really wanted to share with you today is really about this, the spirit and the culture of mission control and the international partnership in this team. And so uh, we had done a lot of the work. The EVAs have been going really, really well. We had spliced in the new cooling unit. And the next time we came out, we were going to test to see if the cooling unit, uh, unit was holding pressure, if these connections we made were holding pressure. And uh, we were very optimistic. And when we got to the very first one and we checked it, it was leaking. Um, and so our hearts sank. But we had, we had developed a protocol for this, and we executed that. We tightened it down a little bit more. We waited a little bit and we tested it again and it was leaking and it was a bad leak. And I have to tell you, we did what all, I mean, I certainly did. I know others felt this way too. We did what all humans do in a situation like this. You know, our hearts sink. We kind of went to the worst case scenario in our minds and we felt like, well, wow, failure was a real possibility um, of all of this hard work. Maybe we weren't going to have a good seal in this cooling system. When we started to go into backup plans, sending Drew back to the airlock to get a, a new splice kit, um, but in the back of my head, I remember, you know, our shared culture in mission control is to just never give up, to be in a creative mode, to create solutions. And I just saw that come from all of the team, even though we all had doubts at that moment, uh, everybody came back together and was thinking about how we were going to move forward and solve this issue. And uh, in the end, we did something we hadn't planned to do and it worked uh, successfully. And then it turned out all the other connections we had weren't leaking. And in the end, we have a functioning alpha magnetic spectrometer. Uh, but the real moral of that story is, it's just in our lives, in the international collaboration, we have to stay in that mentality of can-do attitude and creating solutions. Uh, and that, for me, is uh, truly why we have a successful International Space Station and, we're, and we are celebrating 20 years of continuous human presence uh, aboard the International Space Station is because despite many challenges, and it's not easier to work together as an international collaboration, it's actually harder to do that. But despite all those challenges, we have just never given up. We have persevered. And the International Space Station is a, is a shining example of what we can do when we set big goals and come together. And in this next slide, you see uh, just uh, an image from not too long ago when my colleague and friend David St. Jacques was on board the International Space Station. And, uh, and it, you know, the, I haven't been there yet, but when my colleagues come back and Samantha and Ellen, you know, listening to people like you speak about it, it just changes your perspective on our planet, um, how important it is, and, and how we need to work. You just need to continue to focus on working together as a global community to uh, tackle the biggest challenges. Um, a couple other things uh, that I think are, are relevant is we've been learning a lot about um, medical and the human body on the International Space Station. It's one of the big focuses of the Canadian Space Agency. Um, but we're also now seeing that hey, we could be leveraging some of this um, knowledge that we've gained to help address our telemedicine issues that we have in isolated pockets of Canada. In fact, we're kind of flipping things on its head. Now we've learned a bit in space and now we're hoping to, to learn more on the planet 
and then to use that experience of delivering healthcare in isolated regions of Canada to help us go into deeper space um, where we'll be further away and we won't have the option of returning back to Earth if we have a problem. And in the success of our international collaboration and the International Space Station, um, you know, I wanted to kind of tie it to the, uh, the infrastructure, the global infrastructure that's being developed right now that supports all of us in our everyday lives. Space touches us, each and every one of us, every single day, whether it's monitoring uh, how the, uh, the climate is changing, where the ice is, where the water, where we have too much water, where we don't have enough water, uh, the changing habitats for, for nature, uh, food security for the planet or monitoring our coastlines from a defense point of view. Um, but one of the things that has come out of the International Space Station for us is um, you know, continued expertise in space robotics. And we now see that space robotics is going to start to play a bigger and bigger role in satellite servicing and in how we manage the infrastructure that supports us on the globe every single day. Samantha talked about uh, the gateway. Of course, uh, Canada is really, really excited to have partnered uh, with the same international partners to, to build the gateway. We're gonna, we've already started work on a third generation of space robotics, Canada Arm 3. And the challenge here, it's, it's not really about building another physical arm. We know how to do that. We've done that before. The challenge here is working in deep space. When you go to the moon, you have higher latency. So I mean, a higher delay between when you send a command and when it gets to the robotic arm. And so we won't be able to control it from Earth. It's going to need to be more autonomous and we won't have astronauts on the gateway full time, so they won't be able to do it either. And so we need a more autonomous arm. And we're actually working on leveraging AI advancements to help us in the planning to help ensure successful operations on the gateway. And uh, the gateway to me really speaks to a reusable infrastructure um, that we can you know, start to set up um, you know, for commercial economy. Um, between the Earth and the Moon. Pretty exciting stuff. And so for uh, going forward for the, you may have heard of the Artemis program, uh, going back to the Moon, and we have some of the key pieces being developed right now. This is the SLS rocket. It's a heavy lift rocket. And the SLS will carry the Orion capsule that Samantha was speaking about earlier that allows us to go into deep space and come back at higher return velocities and enter the Earth's atmosphere. And of course, uh, the goal is to return humans to the surface of the moon, um, you know, maybe initially without the gateway, but ultimately using the usable infrastructure through the gateway and as part of an international collaboration to put humanity back on the moon. And I just wanted you to see um, a few of the lunar landers that are, are being bid right now. Currently, there are three companies that are working on lunar lander options. Um, this one's from Blue Origin. And then there's a proposal here from Dynetics. And then finally, a lunar lander proposal from SpaceX. And as we celebrate this, you know, this anniversary of the International Space Station, I really would just reflect one last time on the biggest success, in my humble opinion, of the International Space Station is truly the international collaboration and the example for all of us. A good reminder that even though it's harder to work together as a global community, it's in our best interest to do so. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, that was very, very interesting. I'll um, come back to you in a few minutes with a couple more questions. Um, Ellen, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the differences between working with the Russians in the in the mid 90s uh, when it was just a bilateral uh, discussion and then the chairing the multilateral crew operations panel with all the partners um, a little bit later down the road. Um, tell us a little bit about that some of the challenges you guys faced? Sure, I mean, you know, one of the things that really comes to mind is I just felt like when I was first sitting across from members of the Russian Space Agency, that really nothing had prepared me for that kind of job. I mean, I'd been an engineer, you know, I had a PhD in electrical engineering, and I, I had been an astronaut, of course, on, on two flights already, but, um, I, I wasn't necessarily an expert negotiator, and I really hadn't worked at that point um, with international partners, so it was interesting. Um, you know, one of the first things that kind of surprised me was just that initially we did have a very different idea of how we were going to operate as a crew on board. And uh, Melanie, you may even have been the one that told me you know, the, the U.S. had this idea that we were going to get married and the Russians were thinking, oh, we're just going to live next door. 
<laughs> and good, um, good fences make good neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> definitely a theme of that there. Exactly. And um, you have to realize that at the beginning and for the first several years, there was going to be just a crew of three on board and it was going to alternate between, you know, two Russians and one American and two Americans and one Russian. So from our point of view, we really felt like everybody on board needed to be trained on both the U.S. and the Russian segment and to work together because certainly the way we worked on the shuttle was we generally had two people working on any task just to, you know, help read through the procedures, kind of make sure we were following along, you know, somebody to double check your, your clicking the right button or hitting the right switch, all that kind of thing. And um, that was initially not at all what the Russians were thinking. They, we were just going to be kind of on each side of, of the um, space station and uh, and even that we would have to check with the ground be between before going between the U.S. segment and the Russian segment. And uh, that, you know, I just remember being I just I couldn't imagine having already been a crew member how that would work. And in the end, you know, there were cosmonauts who um, were part of the team that were negotiating on the other side. And I think they could really think through this scenario too. And we did end up operating as an integrated crew when when we had three people on board. Um, and really that was that was the safest way and the way that you could actually get the most done. Um, uh, one of the differences between those negotiations and then a number of years later, probably 10 years later, um, when I was head of the multilateral crew ops panel was, um, you know, initially, you know, I was a woman in my 30s, um, essentially negotiating with Russian men, mainly in their 50s and 60s, a lot of whom had worked on their human spaceflight program during um, the Apollo era, during the 1960s. And for a while, I think they just kept waiting for the other person who was going to walk in the room and actually sign the protocol. Like they couldn't really believe I was going to be the one <laughs> who signed off on whatever it was we agreed to on, on this part of the protocol. So 10 years later, um, first of all, I, um, you know, I knew the, the Russian who was uh, the representative from the crew from the cosmonaut office who was on this panel. Of course, I'd flown a couple more times, including as part of these assembly missions on the ISS. And then I knew, um, I think two of the other three members on the panel um, from, you know, just uh, the jobs that I'd had in the office um, over the years. So I think we were meeting much then more as equals. Um, we'd already been operating on board with a crew of three um, representing the US and Russia. And, and really now our task was integrating. Um, the Europeans and the Canadians and the Japanese in terms of actually having their crew members on board and operating this station, which was going to, in the next few years, grow and, and add all these laboratories. So it, so it was a really interesting time. And, it, and it, a lot of it was sort, just sort of negotiating between the different space agencies and realizing you know, that each one, we all had this one larger goal, thank goodness, that you could really point to. But of course, each country had their own goals as well in terms of what they wanted to do, maybe when they wanted to have a crew member on board, um, specifically what they might want that crew member to do. And so it was really, you know, a question of trying to accommodate everybody's uh, desires. That was awesome. I, I had some similar experiences in, in the international agreements arena, so I'm very <laughs> Very sympathetic. Um, the, it's hard to have credibility when you're 33 and the other person, like, help Yuri Gagarin climb in his capsule. <laughs> it's, it's just you're not on the same, you know, you're not starting from the same place. So, oh, yes. You understand. And, and I have to say that um, it was your work, even earlier than I got involved, that, you know, led us all to actually be able to be talking together. So, I have to thank you for the, the work that you did on those initial agreements between countries. Goodness, I don't know. I don't know how much that helped, but, but I'm glad if it did. <laughs> um, why don't you share with us a few, uh, some of your thoughts on why it's important to explore beyond low Earth orbit and how ISS has prepared us to do that? You know, we're really just at the beginning of understanding, you know, what we can learn from space and really sort of exploring it as a frontier. And, you know, I think back to a few years ago, um, you know, not too long before I left NASA, and we were really talking about um, 
you know, what is it that NASA brings um, to the country? You know, what is the end in NASA for? What is, why do we have a National Space Agency? And, and are we going to continue to have that just given how many other companies are being involved? And, and it really came down to five or six things. And one, of course, was the ability to make new discoveries, to expand scientific knowledge. Um, one was about developing new technologies, which can then um, support the economy here on Earth and actually even lead to either new industries or new markets. Uh, one is about solving societal problems and things that we can learn in space um, that we can apply here on Earth. And then, of course, there's um, global engagement and leadership. <clears throat> and then, um, just like Jeremy talked about, there's the inspiration and pride. And as we looked at all of NASA's programs, they all you know, brought two or three of those um, priorities um, as, as their main advantages. But the International Space Station was the one that encompassed all of those. And um, which is one reason I think it's just such an amazing program. And so we've been able to not only use it for scientific discoveries, but to think about let's use it as a test bed for exploring beyond low Earth orbit. So I know, for example, we've tested out um, a new device for removing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's going to be used on Orion. And uh, we've uh, uh, using it to test new exercise devices. We have, as I think Samantha will attest, we have some really good exercise devices, um, but they're very big, they're very heavy, and there's no way they're going to fit on the kind of spacecraft that you need to go beyond low Earth orbit. So we're testing out smaller ones there, um, learning a lot about human health and performance in space, which, you know, you have to understand the changes and then the mitigations before you can send people out. So it is just serving as an amazing test bed for thinking about exploring beyond low Earth orbit. Thank you. Um, I think, um, yeah, you did a great job of describing describing how all the benefits that ISS brings to the, the world and the, the nations that are participating. Um, we could go, we could spend an entire separate panel just talking about uh, the, the spin-off technologies. Um, if you had the chance to visit the ISS as a commercial astronaut, would you do it? Well, Assuming you know, not I, take $20 million or, or <laughs> going great is. Assuming that part was comped, would you, would you do it? Yeah, you know, I would love to see the parts I haven't seen, you know, especially the cupola, the European and the Japanese lab. Of course, it grew so much um, since the last time I got to see it in person. But, you know, to me, um, as wonderful as it was to experience in it, it, it was really about the mission, about what I could be accomplishing. And um, so if I was going back, I would be, you know, it'd be like, well, am I get, do I get to be involved in the research? Do I get to help develop some new technology? Uh, maybe we're learning more about the earth and earth systems, or, you know, maybe we're testing out things to go uh, beyond low earth orbit. So, you know, that's what I really loved was being part of a mission, working um, as part of a team. And to me, that was a huge part of the experience, not just, you know, me personally um, getting to look out the window or, or float around. So tell us a little bit more about uh, building the ISS. I know there's a lot of things that if you're in NASA, you know about things like if we change the order that a module goes up to the space station, the assembly sequence, it changes everything. The software guys are sitting there going, no, don't change the order again because it really messes them up. But tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you saw from, especially from a crew perspective, where uh, how changes in those, those the order of things um, or what vehicle somebody was launching on. Yeah. Tell us about some of the challenges for the crew in, in uh, preparing for flight. You know, it's everything from, you know, really little things to really big things. And, and you know, if you're American, um, you know, you always have this problem in your garage of do you use the English tool or the metric tool? And we had that exact same issue on board the International Space Station because, you know, these modules and all the equipment in them was built around the world. And a lot of it was built in the US and that took one set of tools. And, you know, you just kind of shake your head that we're still in that situation where we've got to decide whether or not we're using the, the metric tool or not. Um, you know, so that's uh, uh, just kind of one of the things that we had to deal with. Um, you know, 
obviously the, probably the biggest change in the time that I was involved with the International Space Station happened um, because we lost Columbia and her crew. And at that point, um, you know, going beyond um, just the, the tragedy of it and trying to understand what happened, it really changed the entire logistics um, model for the International Space Station. We were planning to use the shuttle for the life of the station, um, not only to take crews back and forth, but to take all of our supplies. And um, uh, when NASA was told, no, you need to uh, retire the shuttle as soon as you finish the assembly, um, everybody had to scramble um, to determine that we, we're going to have to do things quite differently than we expected. And so, uh, you know, uh, for, I was um, just in management at, at that point time. So it wasn't, we, we did change up the assembly sequence at that time. We shortened it. We had uh, many fewer flights than we were originally planning to have to complete that. Those all got reconfigured. Um, but we then also had to realize that um, in a few years, our crew members uh, would be going up in the Russian Soyuz vehicle. And so we had to prepare in terms of training for that. And then uh, that, of course, really gave an impetus to the commercial cargo program and then the commercial crew program as well. So you can see, um, you know, the ripples of that through today. Um, going back to my very first mission um, on the station, STS-96, just one little um, anecdote. Um, of course, for four or five years, we had referred to the node as the node. I mean, it, you know, it was the, the first piece that the U.S. was uh, manufacturing and developing and sending into space. And of course, um, for a few years, it was uh, really the only U.S. Um, piece of equipment up there. So, uh, you know, as we practiced in training, uh, you know, we'd call down to Houston and, and in general, you'd say where you were, you know, shuttle or node or um, FGB, just so they would know where you were talking from. So you say Houston node or or whatever. Well, not too long before uh, we flew a few months, but we'd already been in training for a while. It got named, right? It, it got named Unity. And um, so, of course, uh, the word came down is that, you know, when you call from the node, you need to, to use the, the name Unity. Well, I think it was Tammy Jernigan that pointed out, you know, if you if you start to say node because that's what you're used to, and then you remember as you're saying it that you need to say unity, what really comes out is nudity. And, and so we started joking about that in training and call it, you know, we just uh, called a mission control during training. Yeah, Houston from nudity. And, uh, but we realized like that is such a bad idea because as, as every astronaut knows, you know, Train like you fly, fly like you train. And um, I don't think we ever actually said that during flight, but I do remember there was this one flight day where we got this note up in our um, you know, morning mail. It was just a, hey, reminder to the crew that the, um, the uh, intercom in the space hub um, sometimes bleeds over to air to ground. So just, just a reminder. I was like, okay, what did we say? <laughs> Anyway, that was just one of the tiny little things that crews deal with. So I had a um, colleague from ESA um, who was a, an ops guy, and he um, he had a great, as we started to name, you know, Unity, and then we had Harmony, and we were going down this. He, he was speculating about future possible names. He had uh, absurdity, monstrosity. <laughs> he had a hilarious <laughs> string of potential names for future modules. So, <laughs> It was a lot of fun. Great. I love it. And let's see. OK, I think uh, why don't go. I'm going to ask Samantha a couple of questions. So let's go over to Samantha. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, so Samantha, what surprised you most about living on the ISS? You know, I, I think what what surprised me most is how quickly it became my home. Um, you know, you 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 train for it for years, you know, you spent countless hours in the mock-ups. Um, then you get up there and you have this very strange feeling of being in a place that's incredibly familiar to you in, in some ways. Uh, but at the same time, it's also so strange because you're floating and, you know, guess what, when you train on the ground, you're not floating. 
um, but also because it's like this really lived place. You know, it, it, it's like, you know, going to visit a model house that they're trying to sell or going to visit a house that's on sale, but there's actually people living in it. You know, it's a little different. And so you, you get to this place and it's like, OK, the mock up was like the model house and this is the real house. You know, you, you realize people have been living here. There is this sedimentation of, of, of lives lived up there. Um, you know, plus all, of course, all, all the clutter, all the stuff, um, you know, that yeah, it's not really clutter. I mean, most of it is exactly what it should be. But, you know, at the first glance, it could look like clutter. Um, but after that first moment of having that mixed feeling, it, it becomes, or at least for me, it became incredibly quickly very, very familiar. You know, within a matter of, of very few weeks, I felt like this is my home and floating so microgravity weightlessness became just my normal way of being and and I, I i remember at some point trying to conjure up in my mind the feeling of walking or or lying in a bed and feeling that pressure on your back or feeling you know your weight on the soles of your feet and i couldn't you know i, I could try to use proxies but i couldn't really really feel in my body that that how it feels to walk, which is very strange because, you know, I had been walking all my life up to then um, and, you know, floating was just the, totally normal. And, you know, my, my crew had become my family, you know, it, it was completely normal to just share experiences with them that you usually share with your family, like, you know, you're putting on your deodorant or, you know, I think I think it was Butch who made that comment. It's like, I don't, I don't think I've ever put my deodorant in front of anybody except my family. <laughs> Um, you know, so you you share your your entire life with uh, with these people, and uh, yeah, it, it became very quickly very normal. I've heard from a couple of uh, long duration astronauts that one problem they have when they return to Earth after a six month mission is they tend to drop stuff because they've gotten so used to just letting go of something or and then it just you know it doesn't just stay <laughs> in its place it drops right to the floor and I've heard that's a common a common issue um what were some of the challenges the biggest challenges of of that long mission because you launched in the fall and you landed in the summer and so you were there for six seven months what was what were some of the biggest challenges of, of that duration of a mission um you know i I always have a hard time with this question because to be honest, I actually, you know, I enjoyed it. I had a great time up there to the point that, you know, when we were getting towards the end of the mission, the last few weeks, you know, I was getting really sad about, you know, realizing that my time up there was running out and you, you never know, you know, I, of course I hope to go back hopefully in a couple of years, but you know, you, you never know, you know, it's a place when you leave, you, you never know if you're ever really going to, to be back. Right. Um, and so I was, I was getting a little bit melancholic, you know, every time I saw on the timeline some activity which was related to return, you know, I felt a bit sad, you know, like, okay, here you have an hour to prep your stuff or to prep your data for download or, you know, to, you know, you, you have to uh, put on your so-called suit to make sure it still fits, all of those things. I was like, oh gosh, I mean, you know, it's like yeah, the, the return is really coming closer. And uh, and I kept making those jokes, especially with Anton, um, a Russian commander. I was like, you know, having to because we were coming, we were supposed to come back in early May, and that's the a period is called Maisky Prasniki, which is is a lot of holidays in Russia, the back to back. And so I kept making those jokes to him. It's like, oh, I'm sure you've heard something, you know, from soup from Russian mission control that they're going to postpone that. I mean, who would want a return of a crew during the Maisky Prasniki? I mean, that you know, it's absurd. <laughs> you must have heard something. So we had that running joke and. And, and and you know and then we had a, a progress so a Russian resupply ship that didn't make it there was a failure of the of the upper stage and it didn't make it to space station so you know in, in itself of course a bad a bad thing um, but as soon as that happened because it's the same launcher or actually the upper stage was different but it you know it, it's basically the same launcher that launches crew we realized immediately that a replacement you know or, or you know the, the the three crew members who were going to come up two weeks after we were supposed to leave, they were probably not going to launch on that date, you know, that that would be an, an inquiry and an investigation and some mitigation steps and, and so on. And so certainly their launch was going to be delayed. And there was so much work on space station. I was like, you know, 
they bet they're going to ask us to stay longer. <laughs> and so we, we, you know, our running joke with Anton became, you know, it's like, well, now there's a chance, you know, we'll see. And then eventually they did ask to stay longer, uh, a month longer. And I was like, yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest challenge for me was really getting mentally ready to come back. Uh, and, and that month really helped. I mean, by the end of that extra month that I got to stay, um, I felt that I was, you know, now I was ready and uh, and I could come back with peace of mind. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I'm glad you're I'm glad your wish came true. The um, um, so I, I uh, get the impression that you're pretty good at languages or maybe interested in languages. How many languages do you speak? This is, a, a you know, I've seen this from ISA colleagues in general, but you seem to have quite a yeah. few. Yeah, I've, I've had a chance of living in different countries, uh, you know, growing up, going to school and then college and then working. So I, I do speak German and French and uh, and Russian, of course, and uh, and I'm, I'm working on my Chinese, which is definitely a challenge, but it's getting better every year. <laughs> and you're not too bad at English, I might add. That's very impressive, so very fluent. Um, I see you enjoy yoga. Did you ever try and do any um, uh, any yoga on the space station? I realize that you, know, you have to find the place where you can reach the foothold and and somehow stabilize yourself. But were you able to do anything like that? I did not. I, I didn't think it was going to be possible because it's very much based on body weight, right? Uh, and so I wasn't really sure how that was going to work out. But I. Um, I did. I didn't mean before the flight, but then I never really got around to doing to actually talking to a you know more experienced yoga practitioner or a teacher or something to see if they had any idea of you know some way that you could do some yoga. Um, but again, I never really got around to it. So maybe, maybe next time. I mean, I, it's definitely something that I'm still curious about. <laughs> it can be hard to find a space yoga expert. So um, yeah, I can understand that. Um, tell us a little bit about the Gateway program. I know you're working, that's something you're particularly working on for ESA. Tell us a little bit more about that and how it's um, going to help us um, get more out of our visits to the moon. So the Gateway, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be this, uh, this permanent infrastructure which is going to fly on this orbit around the moon. Um, it will fly around the moon once every seven days or then complete an orbit um, every seven days. Um, and it will get quite close to the lunar south pole and then fly quite far out, I think 70,000 kilometers far out and then to about maybe a thousand kilometers close to the lunar south pole. Um, it's not going to, it's much smaller than space station. It's probably about a tenth of the, of the pressurized volume. So, you know, nobody, nobody should think about it. an actual international space station uh, that far out. Um, and, and that's definitely a challenge. Um, but again, it's it's much closer, I think, to what would be the reality of, of, of a habitation element flying to Mars, right? So I, I think that's part of the usefulness of gateways, like how you, how you, are able to pack all the functions that you need in, in a much smaller volume. You don't have all the real estate that you have on, on space station. It's not going to be permanently inhabited. Uh, so, you know, crews will fly to Gateway initially for missions of probably the first mission will just be a couple of weeks and then, you know, it's going to be maybe 30 days. And then as it gets uh, also completely built, um, the idea is to go beyond 30 days. Um, so that's another challenge, but again, a very interesting one, which is, you know, you, you have this, uh, this smaller space station, let's call it, that needs to still function and crew is not there. So uh, a much bigger challenge in terms of autonomous uh, operations, also reliability of, of the systems, because, you know, either you can fix them robotically, like remotely, or there's not going to be a human being up there to fix them for potentially like almost a year, right? Or maybe even longer if there's delays in the launch manifest and stuff like that. So, um, you know, the, the technological challenges there are towards uh, autonomous operations and also ability of um, robotic maintenance, not only outside, you know, Jeremy already showed the, 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 the next generation in Canada that uh, will be installed on gateway on the outside. But there's also a drive to have internal robotics. So potentially have like, you know, little robots inside that can do some maintenance, but also logistics. You know, you could have 
um, a logistics vehicles that comes up before crew arrives and potentially you could have internal robotics taking care of like um, unloading at least part of the cargo so that doesn't weigh as heavily on, on the crew time when, when, when crew members actually arrive. Um, and, and then it's like this, this uh, command and assembly post in, in, in moon orbit. So if you're talking about a moon lander, I think the idea is for the first Artemis missions to have landers that are not reusable, but at the same time, you know, looking longer term and at later missions to actually being able to reuse, you know, at least some elements of the lander, if not eventually all of them. Um, and so um, having a place where you could, uh, you know, have them dock uh, and, and wait for the next mission or potentially refurbished or potentially refueled in, in moon orbit is going to make the program overall a lot more uh, robust and uh, and sustainable. Uh, it can be a platform where you can practice um, tele operations on the moon, like for example, you know, having astronauts on on the gateway, uh, remotely controlling a, a rover or generally speaking robotic assets that can also do valuable work on, on the surface of the moon, both in terms of building infrastructure, scouting, exploring, um, even gathering samples for, for them, uh, later human missions to go in and, and get them. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listing a few things that come to my mind, of course, I'm sure that there is many more, but um, another thing, of course, is the electric propulsion. So the idea is to really validate in deep space um, electric propulsion. So Gateway is not meant to stay in that one orbit all the time. But when astronauts are not there, it's actually supposed to move uh, between different orbits around the moon and to really demonstrate the capabilities and reliability of that advanced electric propulsion, which is again very much relevant for for future missions, you know, going to to Mars. Right. I I I think also one of the biggest uh, the things I I appreciate about the Gateway is it gives us the opportunity to really explore the whole moon to go to different places on the moon instead of being locked into one destination from before you leave Earth, you're, you know, you're locked into one point like we were with the Apollo. The nice thing is as we learn more about the moon and its resources and want to explore that, it gives us a lot more flexibility. So I think I think that's a really cool, a really cool program. Um, there's a great picture of you, Samantha, out there uh, wearing a, a Santa hat um, on the space station. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it was like to celebrate Christmas and New Year, the holidays on on the space station. Tell us a little bit about what you know. How did you guys celebrate? So well, first of all, we decorated. Uh, so we we had uh, there's props on on board. So um, somebody, I, I think it was Butch in our case, our commander, you know, as part of his uh, taking care of crew and crew morale um, efforts, uh, he really made sure that um, we decorated for Christmas. Um, so he went and dug in, in this, you know, there's like bags that are, you know, experienced crew members usually know where they are, otherwise you can ask uh, um, mission control, but that they will basically be stowed behind a closed hatch or some, some remote place and you go and dig them out and you start looking for props and one of the props, of course, is a Christmas tree. So we had it on the on the ceiling, what you would call the ceiling if you were in, 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 a, in a house on, on Earth. So in uh, on Earth, you would say it's hanging from the ceiling. Of course, it wasn't. It was just stuck up there. Um, and so, believe it or not, my 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 partner here on uh, on Earth, he he did the same in our apartment. He actually hung the Christmas tree <laughs> from the ceiling. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. A bit more work than just sticking it to a piece of Velcro on, on the him than for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. And then we had uh, socks so that there's also um, those on board um, and, and you know they, they had our names on there with the six crew members and basically the idea was that you would put the gifts for your crew members, for your crewmates um, in there and I think all of us had foreseen in our um, crew care packages some little things for our crewmates as well. Um, uh, but then I think something that we all ended up doing, which is kind of nice, is we, in the weeks leading up to Christmas, as we went through the rotation of the different food boxes, you know, you, you would go through a breakfast food box in eight days or whatever, and veggies and so on and so forth. Um, if you would uh, find something that you knew one of your crewmates really, really liked a lot, you know, you wouldn't eat it, you would just put it in their, in their socks. So then for Christmas, we all had a little supply of our, of our favorite foods, which is, I thought was really nice. 
I love it. I know a lot of barter goes on with regard to food. <laughs> I've heard some stories. Um, but thank you so much, Samantha. That was really, really interesting. Jeremy, I'm going to ask you. you a couple of questions um, now. So one thing that you you mentioned in um, in connection with the Nemo experience was the comm delay. So I'll tell you, I want to tear my hair out if there's a half second delay on my cell phone. So how on earth did you get used to that five minute delay and how irritating was it? It just it's I think it's one of the more fascinating things about the, the you know future deep exploration. You just have to totally change how you do operations. What did you learn through that and how did you adapt your behavior? Yeah, that's really it, Melanie, is that it was a big enough calm delay that we just completely changed how we worked. And so it didn't end up being annoying. I think it'll be more annoying when we're, say, on the, the lunar surface and we've got you know, just a little bit of calm delay and uh, we end up you know, stepping on each other, if you will. You know, that, that often happens when you have a delay. Then you know, even this happens in phone calls sometimes if you have a kind of a, a long connection, um, you both end up talking at the, at the same time. But in our case, with five minutes, you know, that, that just wasn't happening. And what we ended up doing was very quickly, we abandoned voice communications because you can imagine that if like just one time, you know, you have to say, say again, because you didn't understand what the person said. I mean, all is lost. You just you wasted 10 minutes um, on that one misunderstood call. So we abandoned voice communication pretty quickly. We did have, uh, we had voicemail availability so that somebody could essentially leave you a message and then you could play it three or four times if you needed to try and understand something that didn't come through loud and clear. But mostly we went to text and email. Um, and then one other thing that was interesting was for the spacewalk. So we would do these simulated spacewalks on the ocean floor. Uh, we would go out and we wouldn't be able to text out there. Maybe in the future, we'll be able to use voice to text, send text messages from inside the spacesuit or something along that line, but we didn't have that capability. And so what we ended up doing was we had somebody inside uh, the habitat speaking with mission control or texting with mission control and then they were in turn speaking to us and, and that is how we operationally got things done the other thing that i found kind of interesting was we wanted to make sure that we were still able to get the benefit of the brain trust that is mission control so you can imagine when they are doing a spacewalk on the moon for example or like i explained earlier on the international space station we have instant access or essentially instant access to the brain trust and mission control but on um, these spacewalks on mars simulated mars we couldn't do that um, or by the time that they, you know, had input for us, we were gone. We had already left that site and we'd moved on somewhere else. So we actually ended up changing our plan or planning our trajectory so that we would revisit every spot. And so if Mission Control saw something at site one, uh, they would they would have, you know, maybe half hour or even an hour before we be would be back at site one and uh, they could give us some feedback and say, hey, we saw that you missed this, or we saw something really, really interesting, we want you to do something else. And so we would give Mission Control that opportunity to feed into our exploration. Okay, very interesting. Um, tell us a little bit more about being a, a Capcom um, or the IV crew member for an EVA. How did you prepare for that? So did you go, so the crews, uh, for every spacewalk, I know the crews do, multiple, many, many, um, what we call NBL runs, the runs in that giant um, uh, facility with the swimming pool that Samantha showed during her um, her uh, presentation. Uh, would you go, did you participate? Were you in the tank or or just there following along with the choreography and and all of that? And I, I understand, you know, it, it takes a lot of um, planning to get the efficiency and get the most efficient order of events. And then when you have to build in things like comm delays, I imagine that's challenging. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's interesting. And the answer is it, it really depends. Let's say we had an emergency creep up on space station today and we're like, oh, we need to go out the door and fix that, you know, as soon as possible. Maybe we'd be planning to do a spacewalk on Monday. Uh, so we we call together what we call team four and we'd have a whole bunch of people try and figure out the plan between now and Monday and then, you know, walk the astronauts through it. And, and I've actually done one of those before where I was the ground ID. I didn't do it in the pool at all. Um, you know, basically, we did it all in our heads on paper, and we based it on our ex previous experiences in the pool. And it was, and it's, it would be with respect to hardware that we had familiarity. We'd seen before. We kind of knew how it would work. In the example I was providing you with the Alpha magnetic spectrometer, 
the tools and the techniques were all new. And so we had to do a lot of work in the pool. And so in reality, what happened was when um, early on, when we were developing the techniques, I was in the pool and I was developing them. And then once we had them developed, when the actual crew that was going to do the, the spacewalks, Luca and Drew, when they did their training in the pool, I would walk them through it um, over the voice loops at the pool. And so I ended up getting to do both, which ended up being really, really important because it allowed me to put my, you know, a lot of being a ground ID is sort of, you don't necessarily have to close your eyes, but it's the equivalent of closing your eyes and try to imagine where each crew member is, what they're seeing, and try to imagine more importantly, what they're thinking and anticipate what kind of information they could use so that they don't end up having to ask for it. And also so you don't end up calm jamming them with a bunch of stuff they just don't need. Mm. Um, so when, when you're a Capcom for things other than a spacewalk, so I know we've gotten feedback from crews that sometimes we will put something in a written procedure that takes like, um, it, it takes like several pages and they get to the end and like, couldn't you just given us a YouTube video or something? It's, it's kind of like turning on navigation for a trip in your car and then you're pulling out of your driveway and you're like, I'm going to kill the thing before I even get out of the neighborhood because it's so irritating. So, uh, tell us a little bit about how you, how you, um, what you've learned about about the techniques and procedures and the best way to describe how to do something. Yeah, you know, again, I, I think that's, uh, it comes down to a little bit of experience and then also just common sense. And sometimes we, we don't get it right uh, in mission control. Sometimes we provide, you know, way too much detail um, because we're not just not able to, um, I guess, accurately imagine, you know, what the astronaut remembers necessarily or what what they're actually seeing and so a lot of times we, we do uh, tend towards providing too much information and we do put a lot you know very specific procedures so that if you follow these instructions you will not make a mistake you will not break anything um, but then we we also you know with experience we know astronauts will if they've seen that procedure and they've done it a few times we also know they will they will skip over some of that detailed information if they know what they're doing and they just kind of go at it from memory um, one of the things, the tools that we have in, in mission control that's super useful is video. And so we pretty much have constant communication with the crew and we have video most of the time. And if the crew is doing a procedure and they put the camera up over their shoulder and we can watch them, we can basically, you know, in, when it's appropriate, we can just guide them through or help them skip forward in steps. And so, it, you know, it, it's communication. It's like in any team, the better the communication, the better the results. And, and we're always iterating. There are new things like, uh, you know, you can use basically virtual reality or glasses that can basically uh, overlay information uh, to the astronauts. You know, this is stuff that we are experimenting with uh, has a lot of uh, potential to make things a lot easier where you know, the procedures will be coming through these glasses and will basically be just highlighting the things you need to do not so much in words, but more in just very obvious graphics on them, how they get the job done. Or, you know, when you need to go set, you know, imagine setting a dial, sort of imagine setting the temperature on your thermostat. You know, when you got there, it would just pop up the number you need to set it to. Um, so techniques like that would be super useful in the future. Very cool. I was lucky enough to go to the virtual reality experience about uh, for the space station in the building nine, the training facility. And it was, that's as close as I'll get to go to the space station, and it was amazing. I felt like I was I was really there. The part where they let you float above the space station is a little freaky. But I didn't ever think I was afraid of heights, but I think maybe I am just a little bit. So, um, tell us. So you've done. You told us a little bit about your uh, the analogs um, and their their purpose and benefit, and you told us about the Nemo um, uh, undersea habitat. What about um, some of your other um, experiences with analogs. I, I think you went on a, was it a cave expedition in Europe and then certainly cold weather uh, training up in Canada. Tell us a little bit about some of those other experiences. Yeah, so ESA puts on a really spectacular program with respect to uh, caves and they have a new program that has more of a geology um, focus on it as well. Uh, the caves one I did, very similar to Nemo, we spent about a week as a team of six working together, a team of six astronauts, internationals, um, and uh, learning how to cave. And none of us were cavers, so you have to learn, you know, different techniques, uh, ascending and descending with ropes, and uh, and then how to do science. We we learned about, you know, what to 
you know, what do you re what can you really learn in a cave? What kind of science can you truly do? And then we did real science. Uh, you know, we were proxy scientists, just like we would be on International Space Station on behalf of uh, our found scientists who wanted to learn things about this cave we were exploring. And then we went, uh, then we spent a week in, in a cave as a group and our, we had a map of the initial, I wanna say is about a kilometer, a little over a kilometer of the map that had, of the cave that had been mapped previously by previous teams. And then our goal was to explore further into the cave and to do science. And so it was really neat. Um, it's the most dangerous thing I've ever done. Uh, Caving is really dangerous, and which is, I thought it was a spectacular training opportunity for us. We knew it was dangerous. We had great training. We had great mentors in the cave with us to make sure that we were doing things properly and we stayed safe. But you know, the the reason why I say that's excellent training is because we were we were truly mitigating risk every single day, and in space, you know, that that's a reality and. You can, we all get complacent, complacent, humans get complacent. It's just a known uh, attribute that we all have. And so if you're in it 24 seven for seven days, you know you are going to come in and out of complacency. So can you learn to, you know, learn about your cues so that you can combat some of these things that could ultimately kill you on a spacewalk, kill you on a launch or, or kill you in a cave. So I thought that was a really, uh, really valuable training event. Um, and then I just see, I just see mountains different. I mean, essentially, we were sort of like in a cave in a mountain, if you will. Um, so uh, I just kind of see things differently, having spent uh, a week underground. I saw some beautiful places. Some some places in the cave are like you you can imagine you're squeezing through tight spaces, just kind of mud and clay and dirty. And other places are like works of art uh, inside the cave, like just mind blowing works of art, um, just absolutely beautiful. Um, and then I've been on a number of uh, geology expeditions in northern Canada. So the, the Arctic does a really great job of preserving meteor craters. And uh, there's a, Dr. Gordon Zinsky from the University of Western Ontario. Um, he's led me on a number of expeditions into the Arctic and to explore these craters. And we're you know, just doing real geology, real science, similar to what we would do on the moon and on Mars. Um, with a with a team of folks and uh, some spectacular experiences doing that as well. I would imagine that some of the just the experience of living with individuals in tight quarters in remote locations gives you some great training or preparation for the teamwork and how you know um, that's involved in space flight and space travel. Was that tell do you have any anything you want to share with uh, us regarding that? Yeah, I mean, I'd share it's a good reminder for all of us. I would say, you know, experiences like that, you get out of it what you want, you know, what you're willing to, how, however vulnerable you're willing to be. And so uh, the real key in these exercises and in life is to be open enough um, and honest enough with people that they will actually give you real feedback about, uh, you know, how you could improve or how they're impacting or how you're impacting them. Often that's kind of the most important thing. And, and then uh, you try to develop a culture and a team environment where you aren't burying the little things that are slowly building up over time. You're actually acknowledging them, just saying them out loud. Um, it's good. It's good for being a dad and raising kids uh, and trying to, you know, um, use some of those skill sets within your own family. And it's good just uh, in life trying to be part of a high performing team. So it's, it's really valuable. And if you look at some high performing um, enterprises or businesses, you know, they will also spend time, you know, if they, I think some of the best ones out there spend time doing this and trying to build the culture within their team. Um, it really pays dividends. You know, everyone kind of rolls their eyes a little bit at it in the beginning. We all do. And even leading some of these things myself, I'm kind of like, I find it hard just to be like, okay, let's talk about the soft, touchy-feely stuff again. And uh, it can be hard to kind of dig into it. But every single time I've done it, in the end, it's been really rewarding and beneficial. And everybody at the end says, actually, that was worth the time. Do you think the ISS has lived up to its potential? I think, I mean, absolutely. I think the ISS has exceeded um, the expectations that the people set for it initially. Um, you know, just research continues to stream out of it. I and mean, what I love about the ISS is that if you're, you know, any partner nation has the ability to send science to the ISS. And so what I, what I tell Canadians is that, I mean, if you're trying to solve a problem that matters, that has the potential to really benefit humanity, and 
you you might be able to you know get some additional insights by leveraging microgravity in space or the changing radiation environment um, between uh, low earth orbit and on the planet you know whatever that laboratory can give you if it can help you isolate something so that you can solve your problem you you have the opportunity to send that science to space station uh, that's incredible you know, this is it's the only laboratory that we have that can do that that kind of research for us and that's really incredible and i think that's amazing and yet i don't even think that's the most important reason and i, I kind of said this earlier in my comments but i'll reiterate it the most important thing that we're getting from the international space station is a constant daily reminder that we can work together even though it's hard even though sometimes politically and geopolitically it's challenging we, we just have not failed in this mission on the International Space Station. We refused to fail, and that's a great attitude for us going forward. Thank you. Um, would you tell us a little bit about the Artemis program, the big uh, return to the moon and, um, and, um, and prepare us for beyond? I know that's something you've been uh, focused on particularly. Maybe you could share a little bit about your thoughts about Artemis. Yeah, if uh, you know if you didn't get it from my comments earlier, I'm a big fan. <laughs> I was uh, I was inspired. Oh <laughs> I was inspired by humans walking on the moon. I think it is uh, you know one of the mo many impactful things that humanity has done. Uh, I think it inspired the world. And uh, but but more importantly, I, if we don't set big goals like goals that are big enough to bring the international collaboration together, then then we're just missing out. And uh, so I'm I'm really excited about Artemis. Um, I already sing, see it bringing out the best in my country. Um, I see it bringing out the best in NASA. I, I, I mean, I, I see the program moving you know, so quickly at NASA. I just see people really digging in. They have a can-do attitude. And sometimes it's easy to be caught up in that, oh, you know, it'll get delayed or this isn't going to work or, yeah, there's always going to be issues. But I see kind of a, you know, an attraction to the mindset of, well, I'm not going to be the reason we don't get this done. I just think that's amazing. Um, I, I see, I watched four of my friends leave the planet uh, this week on a, a SpaceX vehicle. Um, I watched it from the cave, very inspirational. I just love um, seeing rockets fly. I love seeing my, my friends leave the planet and, and safely get to space. Um, what a great event. But you know, I also saw, you know, while I was watching there, you know, I saw the first stage, I saw engine, it was a night launch, so you could see all this. I saw the the first stage engine cut out. I saw the ignition of the second stage. I could see their light continuing into orbit on that second stage. And then a little bit later, I saw the first stage light up again as it came back to land on a barge in the ocean. Uh, I saw in the news that that first stage is back in port. Um, and we're, we're going to use that same rocket to fly crew two in the spring. Um, and, I, and I'm just bringing it up because it is a real easy visual for people to, to latch onto and how space is changing. And we didn't set out in the Artemis program to just go repeat Apollo. It's like they don't look anything alike. When you if you look at the contracting and the way that the leadership is is you know directing it, we are establishing a foothold in the solar system. That is the idea here. We are establishing a reusable infrastructure. We're opening it up for innovation for not just government agencies but commercial entities to be part of this. I think it's awesome. Terrific. Um, thank you. So I've got a couple more questions I'll, I'm going to put out there to the panel and I will say at least one person needs to punch their button and answer. But um, uh, but if one person has answered and you don't feel compelled, we can we can move on to the next question. So I'm not going to make all three of you answer every question unless you want to. So um, let's see. Why is it important to explore internationally? Some of you have hit on this a little bit, but if there's anything else anybody wants to add, please feel free. Well, I'll, I'll just say, you know, the challenges are immense. And so you, you get a lot more people focused on different parts of solutions. Um, but this is an area, you know, human spaceflight, also scientific spacecraft, where countries do have a history of engaging peacefully and really thinking about the big picture and the benefits that it brings to humanity. So uh, I, I won't repeat what I think we've all said in one way or another, but being able to be part of that where you are engaging with so many different countries and you know, well over 100 countries have somehow now been involved in the International Space Station 
And I just hope we can continue to bring along many different countries as we explore. Great. So um, as we look to put the first woman on the moon, describe the significance of that to you. So I think Ellen and uh, Samantha especially may have something to say. So Samantha? I, I was actually curious to hear from Jeremy about it. I Well, I'd love to hear from Jeremy too. I think I think. Yeah, let's ask women about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, Jim Bridenstine, the NASA administrator, um, has spoken um, uh, a lot about this. He has a daughter who I think the poor girl's been 12 for two years, so probably 13, I'm thinking now, but uh, he has a daughter and the thought of her being able to look up and see herself there as an astronaut, you know, walking in the moon, this, to see that that's possible is something that was really personally meaningful to him. So um, I love to hear thoughts from all of you on what what what's the significance of that particular aspect of Artemis. I will go first since Samantha invited me uh, to say something about it. But I think in, in the when what I've learned and even through you know going through the astronaut recruitment process um, for Canada and being on both sides of that process, both you know as uh, as a candidate but also as on on the board, um, you know when you're in in the pursuit of, of true equity. It does take intentional effort, and uh, I, you know, from my perspective, it's probably easy for a white male to say this, but I, I think we have made progress. I think you know, I, I see, I, I don't even really keep track of the gender of my colleagues in the astronaut corps. They're, they're just capable people that I trust, and uh, I like seeing them succeed and, and fly in space. Um, but I do think there's still progress to be made, and I think that was going to be a really tremendous example. I'm a father of three. Two of my children are, are young ladies and uh, they're, they're tremendous and capable individuals, and they should see themselves in any opportunity that that, uh, that inspires them. Uh, sure. You know, I, I'm glad to see it explicitly as a goal, but, you know, honestly, with the number of talented women in the astronaut office today, it seems like NASA would almost have to go out of their way not to have a woman on the crew, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and Melanie, you've seen it as well as I have over the years, how um, the astronaut um, office uh, demographics have changed. The last couple of selections were either half women or just about half women. And of course, right now in orbit, we have Kate Rubens and Shannon Walker among the uh, among the crew there. You know, the one thing that did hold women back from participating more in ISS expeditions was the spacesuit um, because everybody had to be able to um, to do activities in that. And I know for me, you know, my shoulder width just wasn't compatible. I couldn't I couldn't move my shoulder joint at all in that suit because it went out way past where my actual shoulder was. Um, so one of the things that I think is is really good is that there is a new suit in development that will be used for Artemis. It accommodates a much wider range of sizes. And really, that was that was the only thing that I think prevented us from seeing uh, more women through the years on ISS. Excellent. Samantha. Yes, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with uh, with Ellen um, on, on the one hand. Uh, Yes, it, it, it's great that there is that really explicit goal of, of making sure that, you know, this time women are part of the Simone expeditions, but it, it would happen anyway, right, naturally, because the, the astronaut community now has uh, has so many uh, women who, you know, it would it would just be very strange <laughs> if all of a sudden the Artemis crews would, 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 uh, would be only men. Um, at the same time, I do recognize and acknowledge the fact that we because we belong to this community, we we obviously have this awareness, but in in the wider general public, that's not always the case. And and uh, you know, and and sometimes I find media reports also don't help, right? You know, that they will look at all the history of human space flight and say, well, only ten percent of are women. I mean, you know, it's it's outrageous instead of acknowledging that, okay, you know, if you put together in one big lump the 60s and 70s and the 21st century, you know, you're just 
comparing apples and, and carrots or whatever the right vegetables are. <laughs> um, um, so um, sometimes that, that awareness that we have made huge progress is, is hasn't seeped through to the general public. And so that Artemis crew that will include a woman, you know, that very first Artemis crew, I think is going to have a big impact in um, you know, for, for, for a lot of people who are not aware of all that progress that we have made. <laughs> yeah, we were, I think we were a little bit caught in, where is it, the, the um, amount of press the uh, first all-female spacewalk um, uh, got uh, last year, that was, it was wonderful, it was tremendously inspiring, it was gratifying to see, to see the public reaction to it, so that, that'll be, I just think that'll be awesome. Uh, let's see, last question, and I think you're probably all going to want to answer this one. What's the most rewarding part of being an astronaut other than the awesome view? Yeah, I, you know, being an astronaut just op opens so many opportunities. Um, and I've had really, really, really rich opportunities. But, um, you know, I, I often say to my children, for example, the, you know, the opportunity to travel and to experience other cultures and countries uh, is, is, re is like an immense education. You know, it's one of the most important opportunities in education events that you can have and certainly as an astronaut I feel really fortunate um, I've really expanded upon that and I'm still in the active duty in the military and I did it in the military as well but the you know, astronaut um, job has really opened up my my exposure to other cultures and working with the team and what we've been focusing on today the international collaboration that that um, having that bit set in my head that that is the best opportunity and path forward for humanity is probably the, the biggest gift that I've been given by the program. Awesome. All right, Samantha, most rewarding part about being an astronaut? Well, from a, uh, I guess, really personal point of view, I mean, this job, which is, you know, it, it's, some, it's more like a calling than, than just a job, is, it really brings together all the things that I'm passionate about, you know, from science and technology to you know uh, an operational environment flying a mission which is you know similar to what i did in the air force you know you you, you fly a mission you've got a crew or and, and and you're um you're learning how to exploit very complex machines um but also that international aspect that we've uh, touched about so much today you know being exposed to different cultures and different languages um, communicating about it, you know, I also enjoy very much communicating to to the wider public about uh, about my job. The the challenges of always, you know, uh, being pushed to your you know to the limits to to improve yourself. You know, it, it it's all something that I find very rewarding, and it's not it's not only about going to space it's really you know all about the, the training and and the, and the work in in the many many years that typically lie between you know a space mission and and hopefully another um but then i i also completely agree with ellen about that rewarding feeling that she mentioned earlier uh you know that you know it, it it's not really that much in the end about the view or how fun it is to float but it's really about the mission you know that feeling that you really accomplishing something and, and especially on space station you you have this because your your time is planned so carefully by an army of schedulers on the ground you really have that feeling that every little thing that you do is important it has a lot of meaning for somebody or maybe you're just flipping a switch which is, is you know it's a very simple thing and if you're flipping a switch on the ground and you're turning on a light that you don't associate that with any meaning right but if you're flipping a switch that turns on an experiment, that might be the the end point of years of work of a you know a, a PI and their team that are just dying to see you flip that switch. So every little thing takes on a lot of meaning, which you know I, I think is also very rewarding. I can understand that. Ellen, what were the most rewarding aspects of being an astronaut uh, to you? Yeah, for me, and I talked a little bit about this earlier, you know, it was really the chance to be part of a team, you know, working on something bigger than myself. And I can remember, um, you know, 1981, it was my first year in graduate school, the space shuttle flew for the first time. 
very different kind of vehicle. And and NASA was talking about, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be able to do science and engineering research in space. And you know, I was headed toward being a research engineer, and I thought, wow, how amazing to combine the experience of of you know space travel with actually getting to do research and and building on new knowledge. And you know, in during my time in the astronaut office, I got two flights where we were studying the Earth's atmosphere and trying to learn more about ozone depletion. And then two flights to build the International Space Station, which now allows science to go on, you know, every single day. And I, I just could never have imagined, you know, that I would get to be part of doing something like that. And I love being able to, even to this day, I don't work for NASA anymore, but to represent NASA, to represent the United States, and to have been a member of, a, of an international team in doing all of that. Awesome. Yeah, I so I obviously I'm not an astronaut, but I I joined NASA to be part of the International Space Station. I wanted to help enable building it and I can look up in the sky and I can track its track when it's coming over Houston and say I was part of that. I part, I helped uh, I helped enable that and that's a great feeling. I I've, I've stayed at NASA because I want to see us get back to the moon, hopefully getting really close and uh, and then on to Mars. I don't know if I'll make it to Mars, but um, uh, but it's uh, it's really exciting, very satisfying. The International Space Station, I spent 15 years in that program, is just an amazing team who can literally do everything. I love Jeremy's uh, story of the, the, the challenges on uh, the AMS repair. Um, you know, nothing that team does ever surprises me. It's uh, It's just they can usually figure out almost anything. So very exciting. Well, thank you. Um, you guys were a phenomenal pat uh, panel, just a phenomenal group of people. So impressive. And um, thanks to everybody for joining us virtually. This concludes Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program for November, the International Cooperation in Space ISS-20, presented by the University of Texas Medical Branch. Thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm.